Hi, everybody. This is Mr. Polly. And welcome to Podcast 3. Big Idea 3. Part 2. 7.3 to 7.13. Really, we're not getting all the way through that. Today's just solutions. So, let's get started. A solution is a homogeneous mixture where all samples are the same. The same samples is dependent on magnification. So, if you look at skin right here, see how that sample is kind of the same as that sample, same as that sample. So that's at a macroscopic level. It's looking at my eyes. But on a microscopic level, do you see how this sample is very different than this sample? Okay. Um, so and under a microscope, skin is ew, heterogeneous, right? So just be aware that you can change that by the scale you look at. Solution has a couple of parts. So there's the solute, which is the smaller part. The solvent, which is the larger part, and then combined, they're the solution. So see how this one, I don't know, I'm going to say that's about 12, and I'm going to say that one's about 25, okay? So the solvent has more parts. So the solid is a smaller part. Yes, you can have more than one. So, for example, if I'm making Kool-Aid, which I always do, I think there's a dash of Kool-Aid. Oh, yeah, there is. Um, so Kool-Aid has powder and sugar. Hey, sugar, how are you doing, right? Solvent is the biggest part. There's only one part. It's often water, but not always. Okay. So that's it. Solutions cannot be separated by filtration. The solute is too small, so it passes through. Solutions are separated by distillation. So remember, this is a flame. You got a mixture, you heat up a solution, and one part comes out here. It's cooled down by shooting water in here, and hot water comes out here, and then you get drip, 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 drip. The lower boiling point boils first. That was in unit one. Yeah. And it actually comes back to this, too. Solutions are separated by chromatography. This is also a review. So there's paper chromatography. Remember, I have the dot. It travels up, and you divide by the leading line. There's also column chromatography, right? So you've got your very polar stuff in here. You throw some steel wool in there and it separates by how much it will um, bind to the polar substrate. And then we have TLC, thin layer chromatography. Oh, that's the music I should have had was TLC. Um, and that's it. You know, TLC has a band member who had one eye called left eye, although I don't think she has it. I don't think she actually lost her eye. But these, all of the chromatography things are separating by polarity. Whoa, that is a weird looking shape. Try it again. Much better. All right, so light passes through a solution. So you probably can't see this. Let's see if I can make this green. There's a cup here as well. And there's a flashlight or a laser pointer that shoots a beam of light through here. We don't see the beam of light in the first glass, okay? We only see it through the second one. So that means it has no Tyndall effect. So it goes right through it. All right. Now we get to the fun of measuring concentration, or as they say where I live, measuring concentration. So molarity is moles of solute over liters of solution. Notice solute is the small part, and solution is both parts. Okay. So we're usually going to convert grams to moles. So what happens is you'd think they say, oh, you're going to give me moles and liters, and I'll do this math, except for it doesn't work that way. Typically, they'll give you grams, and you have to do grams to moles, which is this. So if I give you 10 grams, you do one mole over, go to the periodic table of grams, and convert it into moles. And they usually don't give you liters either. They usually give you milliliters, which you have to convert by lead to liters by moving three places to the left. So I'm going to do an example or one, <laughs> just one, to show you how to do that. Okay. So 200 grams of NH2S dissolve in 350 milliliters of solution. Find the molarity. Okay, so molarity equals moles over liters, and that's my goal. But first, I have to convert grams of Na2S into moles. So 2.00 grams of Na2S times grams of Na2S, one mole of Na2S. And little g stands for grams, and little g stands for go to the periodic table. So sodium is 22.99 times 2. 
plus 32.06, which is sulfur, and 78.04. So 2 divided by second answer is 0 0.0256 moles, right? But then it gave me milliliters. The dirty dogs gave me milliliters. Um, 350 milliliters. Remember I said you just move the decimal three places to the left. 350 milliliters equals a 1, a 2, a 3, 0 0.350 liters. So now I'm finally going to get to use this equation right here. So I have moles, 0 0.0256 over liters, 0 0.350, and I'll get an answer divided by 0 0.350 of 0 0.0732, and the units for molarity is molar. It's molar like a tooth, okay? So that's 0 0.0732 molar of Na2S, okay? Now it gets a little bit different because... Um, sometimes it asks you the molarity of the solution, and sometimes it asks you for the molarity of ions. The subscript tells you the multiplier, right? So if I have Na2S, can you tell that there's Na2S gives me two Na's, right? So I'm going to take 0 0.0732 times 2. And I'm going to get 0.146 molar Na positive. Okay. And S negative 2, do you see I only have 1 S negative 2? So I'm not going to show the work of multiplying by 1. Multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything. It's like kissing your sister, right? So nothing really happens. 0 0.0732 molar is S2 negative. All right, all right. Moving right along. Hey, we're in a Roman numeral 3. I feel so special. Dissolving equations. All right, so if I have a molecular compound, which the easiest way to pull that out is two or more nonmetals, which we've been spending a bunch of time with lately, you're just going to change your solid or gas to aqueous. So if I have CH4 gas and it dissolves, it turns into CH4 aqueous. It is perfectly fine and almost expected to show it on writing on the arrow. So when you dissolve and you just put it in water, so that means that water is kind of like a catalyst, obviously you need water to make it dissolve, right? Ionic compounds, easiestly, easiestly, there you go. Well, I'll go with that. Easiestly um, identified by having a metal and a non-metal in it, okay? Not all ionic compounds dissolve, and you're going to see the solubility rules that you get in class. I made a whole bunch of them, so we're ready for them. Um, so not all of them dissolve, but when they do, the positive and negative ions are attracted to water, and they pull those compounds apart. So see how we've got a negative green and we've got a positive blue. I hope I can't see the positive and the blue. And when they separate out, the water molecules, look right here. It's like, whoa, doggies. It's got four of them loving on it. Oh, look at that, right? It's got four little honeys in it. Hubba, 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 right? And then here, the positives, they have a number of little honeys loving on them too. Oh, Hubba, 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 hubba. So there could be a lot. This only shows four. But there could be many, 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 many waters. Many H2O, and, and they're called ion dipole bonds form. Now, it could be ion, and you can say ion-H bond. That's okay, too. You see both. Um, but since many of them form, that makes it more attractive, right? Remember, forming bonds releases energy. Forming bonds releases energy, which means that forming bonds increases stability. So now when these things dissolve, there's a handful of steps that come into it, okay? So one and two are really kind of interchangeable, so it doesn't matter what order you put them in. But you've got solute and solvent bonds that have to break. So do you see how if I have this up here, my greens and blues have to 
have to split apart, okay? In this case, they call it solute here, solute crystal. You have to separate those crystals. And if you're breaking bonds, that's endothermic. The solvent has to be broken apart too. So solvent, solvent, bonds break, the H bonds break, and that means we're assuming water. Which most of what we do really is water, but I just want to say there's, it could be other things. And then solute, 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 solvent bonds form. So when these form, ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba, hopefully those produce more or release more energy than the other ones. Okay. All right. So examples of dissolving equations. AlCl3, I should have put the little states of matter on here. AlCl3 solid turns into three chlorides aqueous and one aluminum aqueous. Three, I'm just going to make my aqueous sign a little bit bigger. Aqueous is AQ. Oh, I guess I could have just done this and actually made it better. I think I will. And then realize I just wrote the wrong thing on this first one. So why does this have a coefficient of three? Well, how many chlorines are in AlCl3? Three. That's why it has a coefficient of three. How many aluminums are in AlCl3? One. That's why it has a coefficient of one. Okay. Now what you have to watch out for is the fact that we have to learn some ions now. Ugh. So you get a list of ions tomorrow too. This is a polyatomic ion that you have to memorize. We've dodged these for long enough, but the time has come. So that's nitrate. That needs to stay together all the time. We're not going to split apart a nitrate. So when this does, when NaNO3 splits apart, it's going to break apart into Na, break apart into nitrate. And notice there's one of each of those. All right. So now, what do solutions look like when we get to little baby? Look at them. Oh, I get so excited for the pictures. Hydration, the word hydration means water particles surround and bond with the solute. So this is a good example of hydration, right? Na positive, water loves you, water loves you, water loves you, water loves you, right? So it's surrounding with water and the bonds are forming. Um, there's attraction of particles. So notice if we have two nonpolar, nonpolar and nonpolar, there's not a lot of attraction there, right? There's temporary dispersion forces. Um, but really, there's no repulsion, okay? So that was my bread and butter in high school. I got to go wherever I wanted to. I always had people that would hang out with me because I wasn't repulsive. I wasn't really that interesting. I wasn't really that fun. I didn't really have much to offer, but I just didn't aggravate anybody. So that meant, oh, little Mr. Fowler got to go. Okay. Dipole, dipole. Do you see how this, I'm going to draw this arrow in black so we can see it a little bit better. So there's a polarity arrow right here. Boom, here's my negative side. Yeah, eat that, all oh, the negative. And over here, this is the positive side, right? And another negative part over here. I don't think that quite showed up the way I wanted it to, so I'm gonna try it in orange. Yeah, oh yeah, look at the orange drawn it right there and drawn it again here, okay? So the negative and positive are attracted to each other because they're attracted back and forth. And then hydrogen bonds are the same, but just a bit better. Bit, oops. Bit better. I have a good car, but Tyler's got a Tesla, so he's just a bit better than me. At least that's what he thinks. All right. Another way to look at particle diagrams. They'll give you this, a bunch of positives and negatives, and ask you to draw some water molecules around it. I want to remind you, water has positive ears, two positives, and a negative chin. So I'm going to throw positive ears around as many of these negative guys that I can. Okay? And I'm going to put my negative chin around as many of the positive guys as I can. And you get the idea of what we're looking for. Okay. So right here, put it close to negatives. And this right here, put it close to positives. Another representation of solution, this would be what something looks like when it dissolves. Okay. What I wish this had, the, these numbers seem to be about even, but I should have um, circles should be more, more, 
more. Okay. And then these dots should be less. Okay. And I know whenever we draw a picture, we're, you know, giving up some liberties and no model is ever perfect. But I just want you to know that should be the goal is to make it clear. If you're drawing solvent particles, I should have up here, I should have way more waters than I do positives and negatives. Okay. So just another representation of it. Uh, other words that go with solutions are concentrated versus dilute. Um, this one right here is concentrated relative to this one, which is more dilute because it has more solute than another in the same volume of solution. So that means my boxes are the same size. It's got, so it's more concentrated in red. Oh, oh geez. Now we'll see if I picked a color that matches. It's probably orange or something, but I did my best. Dilute, less solute. Oh, and color of it would be darker. So like dark Kool-Aid is more yummy. I told you, man, Kool-Aid. Oh, yeah. is much better than light Kool-Aid because it has more solute in it, right? Um, and the same could be true for iced tea or anything else. And it has a larger molarity. All right. Separation of mixtures is 3.9. And I just skipped it because we did it in unit one. Okay. So you can go back and look at that. That is on this test. That works really well with it. All right. And I think the last thing we have, yep, is solubility. So there's a couple of different ways we can talk about solubility. There's the mass of solute that can dissolve. Those it can, not did, but can dissolve in a given amount of solvent. Typically, we're talking grams per liter. A high solubility means a relatively large mass of solute dissolves in a given solvent. So again, if we're talking about grams per liter, a high solubility means that number big. Polar things dissolve polar things because they're attracted to each other, right? Positives, heart, negatives, right? Polar things dissolve many ionic things because the charges attract. Now, if I have a positive and then I have a big old negative, positive may love that negative, but negative might not return that love. It may be more attracted to something else. <laughs> That's so sad. Oh, so you always think about, yeah, you could have had somebody better, but you didn't need them. Not because they didn't love you enough. Oh, so much angst. No. Oh, go to college and find somebody relatively interesting and be happy with that. Nonpolar things dissolve in nonpolar things because there's no repulsion and liquids mix through dispersion. So remember, if I just have something like this and there's no attraction or repulsion, Remember how if I just drew a, a liquid particle, liquids just kind of move around, right? Before you know it, hey, look at that. I've got myself some mixed together solution stuff, right? And now, why did that happen? Just dispersion, right? There's no repulsion. Liquids that dissolve in other liquids are called miscible because they're infinitely dissolved in each other. That means there's no limit to the amount you can dissolve because it'll go on forever, forever, ever, forever, ever, ever. Unlike this podcast, which is over, 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 toodles. Well, maybe not. 